hello and welcome. Uh, we have an interesting discussion today about the creative industry's role in changing the narrative around racial injustice. Uh, I'm Sherry Klein. I am a group account director at the Ad Council, and I work on a number of campaigns like Love Has No Labels and Belonging Begins With Us, both of which are designed to help change the narrative around race, equity, and inclusion. I'm really glad to be here today, uh, but let's face it, it's been a really rough year. Uh, we've experienced a series of crisis, crises, including a global pandemic, mass unemployment, rise in hate crimes, and of course, widespread demonstrations over systemic racism. Um, of course, the American public has really been pushing brands and the creative industry to speak out, speak up um, when it comes to issues around race. Um, last year, the Edelman Trust Barometer you know, said that 60% of Americans said they wanted brands to speak out against the attacks against Black Americans. And we, we start to see some brands do that. Um, and I think, well, we, we've seen a lot of movement. We can all agree that there's still a lot to learn, a lot to educate ourselves on, and a lot to do in this space. And that's really what the, today's discussion is about. You know, we know the, the power of creative agencies and the media um, in, in moving um, issues and using platforms successfully, particularly, particularly around areas of, of racial injustice. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe what some of the strategies are um, when it comes to changing minds and sparking new actions and what we can ask of the industry. Um, so I'm joined today by, with an incredible panel of colleagues who are leading phenomenal work in this space. Um, welcome, maybe if you just want to wave uh, Jayanta Jenkins, uh, Tara DeVoe, and Elliot Lum. And I'm not going to uh, introduce each of you. I'm going to let you speak for yourselves there. Um, so I'm just going to maybe point to each of you, ask that you do a brief introduction of yourself, and then maybe share a piece of content that might be relevant to the discussion today. Sound good? Okay, so Jayanta, do you, what, would you like to start? Please intro, introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, Jayanta Jenkins, and I am uh, EVP, head of marketing, head of content marketing at Disney Plus. Um, and I am going to be sharing a piece of work from uh, my nonprofit that I started Saturday morning a piece we did for Procter & Gamble called The Look, which addresses unconscious bias. Well, thank you, Jayanta. I have to say that um, the look, of course, is part of a suite and series um, that P&G sponsors 
um, where they're really addressing bias, racism, and injustice. And um, for those viewers that haven't seen the suite of, of um, films that have really been created, I really encourage you to check them out. They are quite incredible. Um, and so thank you for your work and thank you for sharing. Uh, Tara, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Tara DeVoe. I'm the uh, CMO of an entertainment marketing company in LA called um, Wildcard Creative Group uh, and a managing director of our immersive content studio, 3AM. Um, the piece that I wanted to share uh, was a, a um, campaign that we did with um, the Ad Council um, last spring. Uh, we were asked to create a face mask campaign that was specifically targeting Black Americans. Um, that campaign called You Will See Me didn't just address the issue of wearing face masks, but we thought it was really critical um, that it also be an open challenge to all Americans to see uh, black people as the mothers, fathers, community leaders, and human beings that we are under the mask. Um, so let's take a look. Even though there is so much against us. You will see me choose to protect myself and my community from the coronavirus by wearing a face cover. Because it's going to take all of us thinking about one another. And even with my face covered, you will see me. You will see me as a mother, a wife, a friend. As an athlete who gave everything to the game I love. As a father, leading by example. As a sister. An entertainer. As a champion for my people. You will see me finding a light in a dark time. To unlock our creativity and push our craft. You will see me demanding the space to tell the stories that matter. As a man who knows that tough times don't last, but tough people do. Join us in wearing a face covering to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Because covering your face is one small act of kindness that has the power to bring us together. Thank you so much, Tara. And I have to say, um, you know, the Ad Council has put out a number of um, assets around COVID-19. And I have to say, we're not supposed to pick favorites, but this is by far my favorite because I think what you explained is exactly what it did in terms of really meshing up the black perspective um, with the sort of public need um, for, you know, um, mask wearing specifically around COVID-19. And so I'm curious just to hear you talk a little bit about the, the importance of that today and, and what went into that. So thank, thank you. you. Um, and then Elliot, Elliot, um, would you mind just introducing yourself? Sure, thanks. Uh, my name is Elliot Lum. I'm with uh, the Association of National Advertisers and uh, work with both our educational foundation, which bridges academia and industry, and then with our Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing, which uh, drives a lot of our diversity and inclusion, inclusion initiatives from an ANA perspective. Um, last year, I got involved with uh, you, Sherry, at the Ag Council, working on some of the xenophobia and was really excited to collaborate with you specifically on the campaign that um, you developed around fight the virus, fight the bias to be able to address some of the um, hate that was going on towards the uh, Asian American community. So and closes some of the work that the director, um, Alan Yang produced. I hear someone go, didn't it come from you guys? Strangers cough at me. Move away from me. Someone spit towards my direction. All the stereotypes that we've worked so hard to break are just gonna be reversed and it won't let that happen. We all have their player part. I donate my plasma. I've been making masks. We deserve respect as much as everybody else. I'm a firefighter, not a virus. I'm a mask maker, not a virus. I'm a nurse. I'm a delivery woman, a chef, a neighbor, artist, bus driver. I'm a doctor. Fight, Fight the, the virus. virus. Fight, Fight the, the virus. virus. Great, thank you, Elliot. And I will just say also thank you. I, without Elliot um, and his network, um, I think that the, the campaign would not have been distributed as broadly as it has. I think one of the things that we really learned from working on this um, piece of, um, of the Love Has No Labels campaign, again, really pointing to the rising hate among the, among, um, the API community because of COVID-19 specifically and the scapegoating of the API community, I think we were able to really tap into a large network of of it, very important messengers, messengers to help spread it. So I'm excited to talk a little bit with you today about that piece. 
Um, so thank you. This is an incredible panel. Um, I'm honored to be to be um, you know facilitating today. I guess let's just jump right into it. Um, so you know, I'll probably ask one of you a question, but if if the you know others also want to chime in, we absolutely welcome that. Um, Jayanta, for you, I you know when we think about long-term narrative change around racial injustice, we, we have seen more brands than in the past, like the PNGs, like Nike, like McDonald's, um, you know, talk about race in their marketing and communications. And you've worked in advertising and media for a long time. Now, of course, you work for Disney. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the industry has or has not changed, particularly in the past year? Well, one thanks again for having me. I think the industry over the past year has had much more of a concerted, concerted reckoning with the lack of people in place to help really facilitate these stories authentically. You know, I think brands like Nike have always shown up, but they also have a really amazing body of athletes who are diverse, you know, and they represent a global audience. And PNG, Mark Pritchard and his team have done phenomenal work understanding the power of their brand and bringing awareness to unbiased, uh, to, to all of the racial, racial injustices. Um, you know, I think, a company like Disney, which I'm very honored to be a part of now, has uh, been at the center of storytelling that has really been uh, something that I think globally has brought aspiration. And Disney has done some things right and they've done some things wrong along the way, as all brands have. But what I really see as a differentiator at places like Disney is they're really working to bring inclusion into the company uh, in terms of the people who are telling the stories, people who are leading. Uh, inclusion isn't just a, an overlay or an initiative. It's, it's actually a way to make the business better and to bring people together. And I want to say that I feel that all brands are doing things in that manner. I, I, we can we'll, we'll further the discussion. I think advertising agencies still have a very, very long ways to go, to be quite honest with you. But um, I think the last year has really highlighted the injustices, the work to be done, and the opportunities. Agreed. Tara or Elliot, is there anything there that you'd like to add? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> I um, I agree. I think that um, I, I think that both brands and um, agencies still have a, a ways to go. I think that we need to um, you know making the the kind of the hires, um, the donating the money. Um, uh, make it, you know, uh, include being more inclusive in their internship program. Those are all kind of the low hanging fruit that I think that um, we saw a lot of um, this summer and extending into the, the new year. Um, I need pot. I need pot. I need pot. I need pot. Um, I need pot. But, but I think that the, um, you know, the hard work is really in doing what Gianta was saying, you know, is happening at, at Disney um, and, and a lot of, you know, in some other companies, it needs to just happen more, which is really doing the hard work of changing the culture and making the culture more inclusive. I love that. And I'm wondering, Tara, if you could speak specifically, you know, I think we've seen a lot of organization increasingly setting DEI goals, which, you know, includes increasing diversity and representation within the organization. And you just showed us a piece of work that goes far beyond um, just, you know, diversity and representation. It really kind of comes through in, in the work itself. So can you talk about representation of Black voices specifically as it relates to the creative process and how that helps really change narrative around racial injustice? Sure. Um, you know, I think for years we've been 
talking about the importance of having the people you're marketing to represented around the the table, right? Um, both on the client side as well as in um, creative and planning and the um, critical kind of departments within your your agency. Um, and that's people of color. It's LGBTQ plus. Um, gender diversity, and I, I think the progress has been slow, you know, having been on both sides of those tables um, for quite a few years, more than I care to admit. Um, I, I'd say that it's it's been slow, particularly with people of color and LGBTQ+. Um, um, but I can share, you know, through the, this, the campaign that we just showed, um, a real example of where representation made all the difference in the work. Um, when the You Will See Me campaign was first presented, it was called You Still See Me. Um, but the conversations that immediately started happening um, within our team made it clear that, um, you know, at a moment where black bodies were being assaulted and black men and women were being killed in their beds, in the case of Breonna Taylor, um, you know, while going for a jog, in the case of Ahmaud Arbery, um, our black team members, uh, myself included, did not feel seen at all. Uh, and so it became a uh, critical for us to make sure that got across in this campaign. And, and so we changed um, You Still See Me to You Will See Me um, and really made it, as I said, a challenge to really see us. Um, that wouldn't have happened if there wasn't representation on the team. Um, and again, and I'm going to beat a dead horse here, but just as important, it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't created a culture where all voices felt valued um, and you felt empowered to kind of speak up and, and, and represent your perspective. Thank you for that. Um, Elliot or uh, Jayanta, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I guess my, I, I'll just say two or three things um, to pick up on that. Um, one, which is like last year, I mean, for me, it was a big emotional awakening when I saw a lot of the hate coming out, like intellectually I understood it, but emotionally it was like a very riveting experience. And then peeling back the onion and talking to a lot of um, Black executives, Asian executives, both in the creative as well as in the marketing space, a lot of nonprofits. You could see like, you know, there's a lot of structural, you know, racism and issues built into the system that requires a coordinated approach. And that was a, a big learning where a campaign does one, one thing, but how do you actually like build an ecosystem that kind of like drives the change that's necessary to actually make some level of material impact? And it's really hard. Right, like nonprofits are doing a lot of the hard work, um, agencies and marketers are doing a lot of work, but often we're not like talking to the other, you know, industries that that are are being aligned. So I think that there is a structural, if it's a structural approach, there needs to be a, a coordinated approach across like all the different players to actually drive change. Um, so that's one thing kind of I learned last year. I think the second thing really is this like all the all the pieces about inclusivity across the value chain when you kind of like put that structural piece there um, needs to be measured and it's really actually hard to measure inclusion right how do you measure inclusion in terms of um, who actually gets to speak in the room and who's actually there how do you measure inclusion when you see which sort of suppliers you actually use and who's behind the camera how do you measure inclusion when it comes to um, evaluating ads and so like, I think the idea is like, how do you embed data into like the evaluation process and specifically talking about marketing and advertising. And that's what I think, you know, the Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing is really doing to be able to, to, to elevate this um, and embed these sort of metrics that have never been embedded before into our ecosystem so that um, the numbers tell a story where those numbers then sort of drive maybe different resource allocation decisions about, you know, how you allocate your resources to, um, to ultimately grow your companies, which is what, you know, a lot of these companies are, are there for. So um, those are kind of like two of the, the learnings that I had from, from last year to address um, this, this uh, to drive change. Yeah, I think, um, 
I think story is a, is a driver as well. I, I mean, clearly brands have responsibility and, and help inform a narrative because um, they're trying to sell things and, and the way they show up to include or exclude frames how people feel about themselves in relation to a brand. Um, but story, I think, is a bit more transcendent and universal. And, um, you know, I, I was speaking with some friends and I, you know, I have a three-year-old son. I don't think he will remember any ad that I have ever made, but he will always be endured by the characters that he, he's growing up with now, you know? And so how do we, in sort of concert with everything we're saying, create the stories where people can see themselves uh, and feel included at that level? I'm, I'm not looking for advertising to change the world. I'm not. Advertising and advertising, the industry is fleeting and, and, and the chasing culture. And um, I think all of us on this call and those listening to this are the ones that inform culture. And at a very high level, you get to do it at a agency and you, know, you have six weeks of, of someone's attention versus maybe 24 hours if you do something meaningless. But storytelling, I think, um, through very many, various forms, really are the things that push us forward. And now that we're in a position to see more creators that look like us at major places, the Kenya Barrises, the, there's too many to name, um, but you feel a distinct change and shift in how our stories are being told and how we're feeling included how we're celebrating each other's similarities. So, you know, of course it's about black stories, Asian stories, Latino stories, all stories, but what are we really doing to bring us all together, together to really celebrate our similarities and push this thing forward? It's not like, again, I'm not looking for advertising to do that. And, and, I, and I think, um, you know, I'm, I feel very fortunate to have been at some really great places but I understand the opportunity, the, the real opportunity is in shaping the storytelling and how that gets delivered and how we find ourselves kind of championed in those ways, you know? Yeah, I, I'd add to that. I agree. Like, I think it's a both ands, right? Like it's a, it's a yes, like all of those pieces about film and theater and representation are crucial. I do think that marketing and advertising has this privileged role in society. Yes, like there's a lot of images that and messages that go out that it get injected into the ecosystem that can kind of have that that repeatability. Does it have the durability of film? Maybe not, but it certainly has the ability to to change perception um, based on what's going on on there. The underlying point, though, I think that's interesting is that you know when you look at like leadership, like chief marketing officers and agency leaders, is that they also are business leaders. And a good example. Like for instance, like the CMO at Sephora, um, like, you know, very conscious, she's Asian. She um, sort of for the first time actually was like, wow, like all of this is happening. I never really advocated for my own community. And now is like starting to bring in like nonprofits into her organization as a marketeer, but thinking of herself as a businesswoman that sort of like represents her, her overall, uh, represents this particular interest for, for her. And that's sort of like, I think the power that I think marketers and advertisers have is that they're also business leaders that can impact change within their own organizational structure beyond what's happening in from a communications perspective. Yeah, I would agree with you, Elliot. I do think that it is, uh, it's not an either or, it's an and, um, you know, I am totally dating myself and the, the Cosby show kind of changed my um, um, and many people's kind of perspective um, about, you know, seeing two black professionals in a home, um, doctor and, and lawyer just kind of killing it on a day to day basis, you know, and, um, and while I had two parents in the home, most of the stories that I was seeing um, you know, in media and how we were represented was not that, and it was a game changer. And so I think that storytelling, despite all of the controversy later, um, I think the storytelling there was critical and kind of moving culture forward. But I do think that advertising um, also has that responsibility um, and that power 
Um, and I do believe that, you know, being able to now um, work on kind of both sides of that, working directly with filmmakers, um, but also working on marketing campaigns, I do see that while you may not necessarily remember the brand in an ad, you might remember that mom and dad and the fact that that dad was that mom and dad were was a you know a black family i saw the disney plus um star ad yesterday and it struck me they were it was a black mom and dad who were sitting down after i guess the kids had gone to bed and snuggling together and turning on tv to watch kind of tv that was there you know for their time that to me is powerful you know jayon to your son phoenix may not remember ever remember that ad, if that was something that you had a, a hand in, but it was powerful um, in pushing forward, um, you know, the stable black families and, and that message and culture. So um, I, I think they have to work hand in hand. And I think it's, it's the, you know, the onus is really on us as a collective creative community to um, ensure that we are always kind of thinking, um, you know, I should be thinking not just about the black perspective, but what is the Asian perspective? What is the LGBTQ perspe perspective? Um, you know, that's my personal responsibility. And, and I think that as, you know, storytellers, whether it's in the 30 second form or the two hour plus form, um, that's what we should be, you know, um, that should be our focus. Any opportunity to normalize what, you um, beyond representation looks like, which we know is so, so important, but how people should act towards each other. I think any opportunity for storytelling that really reinforces those norms just helps the public move along over time. And so I know all of the work that you're doing in each of your spaces is absolutely doing that. Um, I want to thank you um, for joining for the conversation today. Um, and for all of the work that you're doing to really push those norms ahead, because I do think that's really how you start narrative change um, and maintain it and sustain it over time. Um, before I wrap up, I just, um, the way we opened with maybe one short sentence, um, I would love to leave, um, you know, any viewer here today who in this panel with one thing, maybe in the next year, maybe in the next 10 years, um, that you would like to see kind of change um what would what would that be um and we can start with janta um you know what i'm going to close with a poem there's a mountain and it's mighty high you can't see the top unless you fly there's a molehill of proven ground ain't nowhere to go if you hang around everybody wants to tell what's already been told everybody wants to sell what's already been sold What's the use of money if you're not going to break the mold? I love that. That was beautiful, by the way. <laughs> it was. It was, and we, I, we don't want to follow that. <laughs> end there. Maybe we just end there. Well, thank you, everybody who's watching. Um, enjoy the South by Southwest panels. And again, to uh, my colleagues, thank you so much. Um, I feel um, smarter for being part of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Thanks.